Betaflight 4.5 has just hit release candidate. That means that pretty soon I'm going to be telling you Betaflight 4.5 is released and you can start thinking about whether to upgrade. But before you decide whether to upgrade, you've got to know what Betaflight 4.5 brings to the table. Like, is it some new killer feature that's going to make you actually want to go through the hassle of upgrading, or maybe there's really nothing here for you and you should just keep flying whatever the hell you're already flying. You don't have to upgrade to the latest. It's not mandatory. I'm Joshua Bardwell. You're going to learn something today. Before we get into the video, as I always do when I do an overview of a new version of Betaflight, I'd like to remind those of you who say, ah, Betaflight's so complicated, they're always changing things, it's so hard to keep up with. I'd like to remind anybody who feels that way, nobody's forcing you to upgrade this. If you feel annoyed at all this new stuff that you have to learn, just close this video, Forget Betaflight 4.5 exists. Go out and enjoy your quad. This hobby is about enjoying flying your drones, not about flashing firmware, despite how it seems sometimes. There may be some killer features in here that you really want, in which case you're going to feel conflicted. But, like, nobody's forcing you to upgrade this. The other thing I want to say is, if you have a bind and fly quad that you bought, like a 5-inch five, five or 7-inch, it came from the manufacturer, and it's all pre-configured, and it flies, and you're enjoying it, don't flash Betaflight 4.5 to it just because it's like the newest and latest and greatest. It will wipe out the config that the manufacturer put on the drone and then the drone won't work anymore. And then you'll contact the manufacturer. It seems so normal. I just updated the firmware. Of course you update the firmware, except in Betaflight, when you update the firmware, you wipe the configuration out completely and the manufacturer will be like, oh my God, not again. And they'll have to help you get it working again by rolling the firmware back and putting the old configuration on it. So, with those disclaimers out of the way, let's proceed. And of course, in order to find this information, we're gonna to go to the betaflight.com website and the Betaflight 4.5 release notes. These are the key things that the Betaflight devs think you need to know about Betaflight 4.5 before you start using it. Uh, I'll have a link to this down in the video description, and I do recommend you go check it out if you want to dive deeper into this. Most of the things we're going to talk about in this video have an even deeper dive linked in the release notes. In fact, because this is an open source project, you can see a lot of the back and forth on GitHub as these features are developed. But thankfully, the Betaflight devs have also written up a lot of really good documentation for those of us who don't want to dive that deep. I mean, those of you who don't want to dive deeper, not me, I'm all about the deep dives. I love diving deep. So the first thing that a lot of people are going to be happy to know about Betaflight 4.5 is that previous filters, PID settings, and other tuning values should not need to change. So if you have a PID tune that you like using, or if you are using one of the predefined PID tunes from the Betaflight presets tabs uh, developed by people like Sugar K or Mark Spatz, UAV Tech, um, if you've got one of those PID tunes that works for you on Betaflight 4.4, then you're not going to have to start from scratch on 4.5. And frankly, I, this is a, a huge courtesy from the Betaflight devs to all of their users. I get it that there have been times in the past when the devs worked really hard to make the PID loop work better and drones went from flying kind of crappy to flying pretty good most of the time. But it's nice to have a Betaflight release that doesn't just completely shake up the PID loop from bottom to top, forcing everybody to redo their PID tunes. Next, you must know that in order to use Betaflight 4.5, you also need to be using Configurator 10.10. So before you get into all this stuff, you're going to want to go to uh, here and download. Well, currently it is at 10.10.0 RC1. Uh, that is the release candidate version. It, it also hasn't released yet. And there are actually a few small bugs in it. So uh, you're going to want to make sure if you download RC1 that you stay on top of it and download later release candidates as they come out up to the final release. Or if you're not like in an absolute hurry to do this, just wait for it to release in the next few weeks and skip that whole nonsense just download the final release. But I'll go ahead and download RC1 right now and install it so we can actually like look at it. And now you can see that when I run Betaflight Configurator here in the upper left-hand corner, it says version 10.10.0 RC1. 
And that is what we need to see, 10, 10, 0, if we're going to be working with Betaflight 4.5. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the changes, at fixes, and improvements in Betaflight 4.5. And I'm not just going to go down and read you everything in this list. You can also read. I'm going to sort of selectively go through this list and try to highlight and demonstrate things that I think are most interesting. There will be a uh, table of contents down in the video description, and there should be chapter markers in the timeline. This is going to probably be a little bit long, and so you may want to skip ahead to features you care the most about. And we'll start with the changes here in the cloud build system introduced in 4.4. In case you don't know, well, the way that works is we plug in a flight controller that we're going to flash, and we go to update firmware, and here in the firmware flasher tab, we have the ability to choose which options we want to include in the flight control firmware. So in the past, Betaflight firmware included every single thing that Betaflight could do and every single sort of piece of hardware that it might possibly support, and that made the code get really big. And eventually the code was going to get so big that it wouldn't fit on the flight controller. It makes sense. It's really thin. Why would you cram all that code in there? <laughs> Dumb jokes aside, the way the devs uh, address that is by building the firmware dynamically at the time that you flash, and then you can leave certain things out of the build to save space. The default settings for cloud build have now changed. The default radio protocol is now Crossfire, because a lot of people are using ExpressLRS and Crossfire. Uh, if you use SBUS or any of the other protocols like that, you'll need to change this and choose, for example, SBUS. Uh, and uh, the telemetry protocol being set to none. Don't freak out about that. Crossfire always includes telemetry, even if you don't select a protocol here. This telemetry protocol is used if you're using some other kind of telemetry. Um, also notice that there are options down here in other options that you may want to leave out. Uh, there's really no reason to leave them out as long as the firmware is small enough that it fits on your flight controller. Uh, but for example, if you wanted to add some other option and needed to save space, many people aren't going to be using Acro Trainer. If you've got a high definition uh, video transmitter, digital video transmitter, you could delete the uh, standard definition OSD and so on. Uh, under other options, we can go down here and there are several options that have been added that we're going to look at a little bit later and talk about what they are and when you might want to add them. If you want a deeper dive on the cloud build system, I actually did a video about it back when Betaflight 4.4 released, and I suggest you take a look at that. This isn't really a place to go into the deeper ins and outs of this, and there will be a link in the video description below if you want to check that out. One of the most significant changes in Betaflight 4.5 has been improvements and, frankly, fixes to bugs in the GPS system. There's a whole bunch of information here about like optimizations that the Betaflight devs made, and I don't really care about that. Thank you for making GPS work better. I'm sure that's wonderful. As a user, I don't really care. I'm just glad that it works. And Betaflight 4.4 had a bug that it did not work correctly with M10 GPSs. The short version is that M10 GPSs lock a lot more satellites a lot faster and just work a lot better than the older M8 satellites that many people were using. Uh, but Betaflight 4.4 didn't know how to talk to them correctly, and as a result, it, they just didn't work very well. Betaflight 4.5 now correctly talks to M10 GPSs, at least supposedly, and that means that people wanting to get the best possible GPS performance finally can. But Betaflight 4.5's GPS improvements do not just include better support for the hardware, they also include better behavior when Betaflight activates Return to Home. Uh, Betaflight calls their Return to Home GPS Rescue, and I've joked, actually pretty seriously joked, <laughs> that the reason they call it GPS Rescue instead of Return to Home is that the only time you'd use it is if it's rescuing you from losing your craft entirely. It's not like with a DJI drone where you just hit Return to Home because you don't feel like flying home and the drone nicely comes back. There's always been a chance that Betaflight uh, GPS Rescue would kind of freak out because it's just... It's kind of, well, it's always been kind of half-baked. I mean, no offense to the devs, they're doing their best, but you take somebody like Pavel Spikowski who works on INAV and he just spends all day thinking about GPS return to home and how to make it good. And the Betaflight devs think about how to make your drone fly better. It's just not where they put their focus. But Betaflight's GPS rescue has improved significantly and many of the situations that caused it to either fall out of the air for no freaking reason or take off flying the wrong direction 
those things have been fixed. For example, in Betaflight 4.4, if there was significant drift due to wind when initiating GPS rescue, the quad could take off flying the wrong direction and then make a long arc back to the right direction before it finally started flying home. And if the quad crashed into something in the meantime, it would sure look like the quad just flew into an object for no freaking reason. Another issue that GPS rescue had was that if you were too close to the home point, then when you activated GPS rescue, it would not activate and potentially the quad would just fall out of the air uh, for no reason. Now, GPS rescue can be initiated close to the home point, even directly overhead, uh, as long as the machine is more than a certain altitude. So the devs want to make sure that you don't activate GPS rescue too close to yourself because if the quad flies the wrong direction or makes like a long turn before it figures out where it needs to go, it could fly into you and they don't want to let that happen. But as long as it's a certain height in the air, Betaflight 4.5 will allow you to activate it uh, as long, no matter how close to home it is. Uh, and that's a nice feature that they added. One last thing about GPS rescue, uh, if you are using it, go to this page and I'll link it in the video description below. There are an in-depth guide for setting up and tuning GPS rescue to work optimally. And there are a couple things in there that if you don't do them, then like there's a high probability that GPS rescue just won't work. And you'll be like, hey, I thought Bartwell said this was fixed and then my quad fell out of the air for no reason. You need to go read this page in a little bit more depth. We're not gonna go into it in this video though. If you fly with a GPS on board and don't use GPS rescue, you may have found yourself thinking, what the hell am I doing? Why do I even have this? And Betaflight 4.5 has added a new feature to Black Box Explorer. By the way, if you use Black Box recordings and you view those Black Box recordings with Black Box Explorer, there's a new version of Black Box Explorer you need to download too. Well, you don't have to, but you should. Um, and that new version of Black Box Explorer can actually uh, show a map of your flight path. That's pretty cool. There's a button in Black Box Explorer to export a GPX file. And that GPX file can then be imported to online mapping software such as GPX Studio uh, to create something that looks kind of like this. That's pretty freaking cool. Is it in 3D? Holy shit, it's in 3D. I can do this with Betaflight? That's freaking amazing. Uh, FAA, I didn't go over 400 feet. P I promise. Delete, delete, shut down. <laughs> Black Box Explorer can also do a more rudimentary form of GPS mapping built in, uh, where it shows a small 2D map within Black Box Explorer, and as you scrub through the file, it moves, uh, it shows you where you were in space at the time. For those who race, and specifically those who race with LEDs, like, well, Tiny Trainer is the main race format that I know requires that you have LEDs, and they do that because they want to be able to see what channel you're on just by looking at your LEDs. And that means you have to manually configure your flight controller to change the LED color based on what channel you're on. I actually made a video about this a long time ago and the video is now completely obsolete because now Betaflight does that automatically. In Betaflight 4.5, your LED strip color can be automatically set according to your VTX channel. Yay! And that means it should make things a lot easier for those who are doing that kind of racing. Betaflight 4.5 has made significant changes to how angle and horizon mode work. In fact, one person asked me whether I thought these changes to horizon mode were going to change my advice that you should basically never fly horizon mode and it should never exist at all. We'll talk about that in just a second, but let's talk about angle mode first. There's been a problem with angle mode that everybody sort of compensates for, but that one man, Chris Rosser, thought was worth fixing. And the problem is that in angle mode, if you're pitched forward and you're flying forward, if you put in pure yaw, the quad doesn't really like lean into the turn. In fact, the quad will rotate on the yaw axis, but without putting some additional roll input in, it will kind of slide through the turns. And that wasn't what he wanted. Chris Rosser thought, I wanna be able to steer my drone in angle mode purely with the yaw stick. So I pitch forward, to go forward and I steer with yaw and the roll axis is completely unnecessary if I want it to be. And that's what this feature does. Angle mode has changed to be earth referenced. That means that when you put in yaw, the quad yaws about the horizon, not about its own axis. Uh, you can still put roll inputs in to add extra roll uh, if that's what you want. Now, some people are gonna like this feature 
but people who have gotten used to flying angle mode without it are going to hate it. Like whoop racers, probably if many whoop racers these days are switching to acro mode, but those who still fly in angle mode are probably going to hate it. Uh, so if you want to, you can turn it off with this CLI input, or you can lower its strength by setting uh, this, that value to 50, or you could change it anywhere from zero to a hundred. Uh, but if you're just getting started with angle mode, you may find this to be a much more intuitive way. The quad is just going to seem like it turns a lot sharper when in angle mode without you having to mix in roll by yourself. Uh, speaking of turning sharper, angle mode has also been improved due to a, a PID control uh, parameter called angle feed forward. Basically, the angle mode PID controller used to just have a P value. And so if you wanted sharper performance, you had to up the P value. But the problem was that as the P value gets too high, then you get oscillation. And so a lot of people couldn't get angle mode feeling as sharp as they wanted it to feel. The addition of a feed forward term on the angle mode PID controller means that you can have sharper stick feel without having to go to those ultra high P values and it should just feel a lot sharper and be better to, better to tune for those who want to tune those things. As for horizon mode, so first of all, what is horizon mode in case people don't know? Horizon mode is like trying to uh, split the baby if you remember the old the old biblical story uh, where two people are fighting over a baby and was it King Solomon says, OK, let's just cut the baby in half and give each of you a half. And everybody goes, no, no, that's a terrible idea. Right. And horizon mode has also been a terrible idea because it tries to split the baby between angle mode which is easy to fly because it automatically uh, levels itself back out when you center the stick. So if you're like pushing the stick around and you're getting out of control, you just release the stick, you center the stick, and the quad levels back out again and it gets your control back. But you can't do flips and rolls and people like to do flips and rolls. So horizon mode, the way it worked is when you were near the center stick, the quad would level back out again. But then as you deflect the stick further and further, there was a transition point where it would switch to acro mode and you could do flips and rolls. But the problem was that that transition point was difficult to predict. So you'd be in the middle of a turn and you'd be like banking into a turn in angle mode. And then suddenly bleh, the quad was in acro mode and it turned over and it rolled over and it crashed. And it made it really hard to do smooth, precise turns in, in uh, horizon mode. I've always said that horizon mode uh, encourages bad habits and just makes bad pilots. And I know there are people out there who will argue with me and say, no, I learned on horizon mode, it was fantastic. That's fine, whatever worked for you. But my opinion has been either learn in acro mode or learn in angle mode, if that's what you want, but just forget horizon mode. But they've changed horizon mode. How have they changed it? What they did is now horizon mode is basically just acro mode. But when you center the sticks, and the quad is close to being flat, then it becomes angle mode and it holds its level. So like, I'm not sure how I feel about this because in old style horizon mode, if you flipped upside, like what's the killer feature that you want out of angle mode? It's that when you center the sticks, the quad levels out. And in old style horizon mode, if you were like upside down in the middle of a roll and you centered the stick, the quad would flip back over and level out. That seems like what you want. But it sounds like new style horizon mode, if you're upside down and you center the stick, the quad goes, nah, I'm still, I'm still in horizon mode. I'm just gonna leave it to you to turn me back up right side up again. And that's cool. But like the whole reason you're using it is that you don't know how to do that. So the idea here is that like horizon mode, you can get all the acro performance you want. Yay, but I would just fly in acro mode then. But then like, if you're mostly flat and level anyway, then when you center the stick, it'll level back out again. I got to try this. I got to try this to really see if there's any benefit. Um, I could imagine there being some benefit, but like, I got to try it. I don't know. Opinion reserved. Here's a cool feature called easy landing that addresses the thing that Betaflight does when you try to land and the quad bounces and pops up and won't land or you're trying to do a perch and it won't land. Easy landing is designed to make landings less bouncy even when air mode is on. See, the old way of solving this is to turn air mode off, but air mode makes your quad fly better for acro flight and people like didn't like doing that. 
So like some people who like to do a lot of perches or slides will put air mode on a switch. And just before they do a perch or a slide, they'll flip the switch and turn air mode off. And people were like, why do I have to do that? I have to like set up this whole thing and flip a switch. I just want to fly my drone. Easy landing detects when the sticks are centered and the throttle is at zero. And the idea is that if your sticks are centered and your throttle is at zero, you're probably landing, maybe? Because like, think, think about it. If you're flying and you do a big punch out and you lower your throttle to zero and you flip over, you're probably, sticks aren't at zero. Like you've got the roll stick deflected or you're pitching back, you're probably flying the drone. But if your sticks are at zero and your throttle is down, you're probably landing. And when that condition exists, easy landing basically decreases the aspects of the PID controller that cause it to bounce and hopefully make it easier to perch and easier to land. Now, if you want to try this out, you need to know that this is turned off by default. This is a big enough change that they didn't want to make it the default. You need to turn it on manually, and you're going to do that with this CLI uh, parameter. And in order to go back, if you don't like it, you do it like this. And you should also know that there are a couple of tuning parameters you can try to change uh, when landing is detected and when this happens. I'd be curious to hear if you try this out, what you think of it. In fact, we'll probably make a video sometime in the future trying it out and seeing how it works. If you've got a quad that kind of freaks out after you arm it while it's sitting on the ground, it's like shaking and it's like, oh, 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 and then as soon as you take off and fly it, it's fine. There's a new feature in Betaflight 4.5 to help address that called Low Throttle TPA. And what this basically does is uh, reduce the PIDs while the quad is on the ground before you arm. Uh, it's configured by using the TPA breakpoint lower parameter, and that is the throttle position below which the PIDs will be reduced. And then as soon as you raise the throttle and take off and exceed this threshold, the PIDs go back to full and stay that way until you disarm. Uh, for more information on exactly how to configure that, you can see this pull request uh, here in the Betaflight configurator. This parameter is enabled by default, so if you notice that your uh, jittery quad on arming has gone away in 4.5, that may be why. If you have a crossfire receiver that is buried inside an aircraft and you hate having to open the aircraft up to get the receiver to go into bind mode, now you can activate binding in crossfire receivers with the bind RX CLI command. I wonder if you can also hit the bind button in the Betaflight, like typically there's just a bind button in the Betaflight receiver tab where you can hit it instead of having to go to the CLI. Um, but I don't see that here. So I guess you have to actually go to the CLI and type bind RX, unknown command. But that's, but you promised. I guess this flight controller doesn't support that. Maybe the bind button will be there on a different flight controller. I have no idea. Uh, for those who are wondering, does this work with Express LRS receivers? I have no idea, but I assume the answer is no because Express LRS receivers don't like bind buttons that you have to plug it in three times and, you know, flash it and open up a web browser and type in fricking Konami code. There's no bind button on it. Give me a break. <laughs> there are a couple of custom build options that have been added mostly for racers. For those of you who have been flying Ivan Efimov's CAC firmware, you're familiar with these, they're built into the CAC firmware. You can now add these to the Betaflight cloud configurator and flash the full version of Betaflight without having to flash the whole CAC thing. If like, Why wouldn't you want to flash the CAC thing? I don't know, all the racers love the CAC firmware. Uh, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'll put a link to uh, Yvonne's CAC release video and you can learn more about that. If you're a racer, you totally should. I have no idea why, but all the racers run CAC. Anyway. If you want to get advantage of some of these features or you want to know what the hell I'm talking about, um, you can add these custom build options in the configurator. You're going to need to go here. So you got to enable expert mode. Then you'll have access to the custom defines. And you can type in like OSD quick menu RC stats. And then that will be a custom define. Can I put, can I put a, co a comma, a question mark? What do I do? Spaces. Okay, great. Uh, so what are the custom options that you can add? 
Uh, one is an RPM limiter, which is used for spec racing to limit the output of your motors uh, to compensate for varying KV of the motors. The motor will just have a constant max RPM. If you don't spec race specifically, this is for street league spec racing, and this doesn't matter to you. Uh, quick OSD menu build option. Uh, there are some qui a quick menu that has added the OSD to let you configure things like the rate limiter and throttle limit from the OSD, and, which you normally can't do. Uh, there is an RC stats screen, which adds custom stats, like how much time you spent at 100% throttle and your average throttle value. These are things that racers want to know. Uh, and then there is a pre-arm page that uh, shows certain uh, settings that are relevant to spec racing so the race organizers can verify that everybody's set correctly and nobody's cheating. Um, Another op So those are all pretty much for spec racers and pe pretty specific. But another thing that many people may want to take advantage of is Betaflight's GPS lap timer. So if you don't, if you race, you know that you need to know how fast your laps are. And there's various ways you can build a lap timer, but it all involves extra hardware and spending money and soldering things together and flashing firmware. Betaflight has a built-in GPS-based lap timer. Basically what you do is you set the drone at the start-finish gate and you tell Betaflight, this is where my start finish gate is. And then using the GPS, Betaflight detects when you pass that gate and can try to give you lap timing. The accuracy of this is going to strongly depend on how accurate your GPS signal is. And people may get mixed results, but it's certainly, it's included in Betaflight. And it's certainly a feature you may want to play with. Betaflight 4.5 adds hardware support for AT32 CPUs. And this is a big deal for anyone who wants to save money which is pretty much everyone. AT32 is a new processor that replaces the STM32 processor that's on most of our flight controllers. And the big thing about it is it's much, much less expensive. Here, for example, is the iFlight Blitz ATF435 flight controller and ESC. It is an iFlight Blitz flight controller and ESC, just like the F4 version you might be used to, but it's only 40 freaking dollars it was $60 originally, they've marked it down. It was a lot less money uh, for the flight controller and ESC. There are other ones out there, like there's this one from Neutron RC, which is only $26 for a flight controller. I hesitate on this one because I have no freaking idea who Neutron RC is, and I'm always a little hesitant to buy a bargain basement piece of electronics from a manufacturer I'm not super familiar with. But basically, we should hopefully see a flourishing of AT32 flight controllers and ESCs at much lower price points. And when you see those and you wonder, why are these so cheap? Should I be suspicious? The answer is that the AT32 can do like 99% of what you're wanting it to do. There are a few little hardware related bugs that the devs are still working out, but for the most part, it's just a less expensive version of what you're buying anyway, and it's probably worth a consideration. Now, at this point, you're probably wanting a little bit more of a deep dive into some of those features, and that doesn't exist at the day that I'm making this, but it will exist at some point in the future. Uh, I'm gonna create a Betaflight 4.5 playlist. It's gonna be linked in the video description below and I'll put a card on screen to it. And today, if you're watching this at the day of the release, this is the only video that's in it. But hopefully at some point in the future, I'll be testing out some of these features and showing you in the real world how they work. And these videos will be added to that playlist. So I hope you click through and see, well, see what's there. I'll see you there.